In today's podcast, I'm delighted to be joined by someone who is undoubtedly one of the very best racing judges and tipsters I have had the pleasure of coming across in my time at the Smart Betting Club. With nigh on 10 years and over 5,000 bets proved during that time at a 16.9% ROI to fair bookmaker odds, Declan Maher has proven himself time and time again as a racing expert the bookmakers genuinely fear. So Declan, welcome to the podcast. The first question I normally ask my guests is how best would you describe yourself? A professional tipster, professional gambler, equine expert? How would you like to be introduced? I probably call myself a professional gambler because most of my income still comes from my own betting and the tipping service well if it wasn't profitable I wouldn't be making any money and it's really just uh, an alternative to say getting people to put bets on for me and then making the money from that which would be a professional gambler so overall I think it equates to nearly the, the same thing so I'd probably say pro gambler but maybe not on a my mortgage application though I might use something different <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. You don't want to get into that kind of conversation with the mortgage broker, do you? So the primary focus is your own betting and then the tipping helps you to generate further revenue. Is that how you'd balance it up? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And we'll probably talk about this throughout. That you bet on things that are different to the tipping service, but obviously that is based on bookmaker prices. I imagine bookmakers are a thing of the past for you, actually getting on with them. Yeah, I haven't had an account or I pretty still have accounts in my name, but limited to where it wouldn't be worth using them anyway for a long time. Yeah, I, I'll bet on... I suppose it's harder to get uh, the premium bets are sent between half eight and half eleven in the morning and it would bet for liquidity definitely at, before that and during that time would definitely be a lot lower than what it was maybe 10 years ago, I would imagine. So there will obviously be times when I won't get on the horse I've sent as a premium bet because like the odd time and races with more liquidity, you might be able to drip in a few quid overnight without pushing the price in like... And then obviously there'll be times when you get on after you've sent a tip, but there will also be times when, like when I'm sending a tip, it's because I think that price is worth taking at that moment in time. So by definition, even regardless of any of my members pushing a price in, I expect the price to come in anyway. So there will be a lot of them that will come in and then they will come in under what I would actually want to back it at. I wouldn't then be able to back it myself later on. But on this flip side, there will also be horses that I would have been interested in might have a min price of say nine to one. He might have only been eight to one or with the bookies all morning, but he could be bigger on the exchanges or he could drift to the price on the exchanges afterwards. And I will get the back horses like that. I see. Yes, it's a constant balance and overviewing the market to see. I guess we we spoke of exchange for emails. You said you could easily find value in overnight horses that will halve in price, if not more. But that's obviously going to be of little use to people betting into soft bookmakers overnight. So it's clearly a matter of just viewing the market at all times and making a judgment call about what you see as a value price. And if something drifts into that, then it's about taking it. So we'll probably talk about that and your approach in more depth. But I was going to say saying beforehand, you know, I had your brother on before, Kieran, talking about golf. So it's the first brothers I've had um, on the podcast. So I'm guessing that betting just um, was part of the family. How did your love of betting and in turn racing develop? Well, my dad always had a bet, most horse racing, really. I suppose back in the day, it was really only horse racing. The only betting on soccer in, in a betting shop was you had to do nearly the pools or the big, what was the, you had to have maybe minimum six or seven selections in the, I don't even know what they call them now. Like, so it wasn't, other sports betting wasn't as accessible as it is now. Yeah. So yeah, he bet on horse racing. I, I don't know, I remember growing up, I'd be, I used to love the Grand National and Cheltenham and things like that. And we'd be allowed a small bet like our, Dad would put on a little bet for us or maybe a play spot or something like that. Yeah. So I suppose all my betting when I was younger was more fun betting rather than actually, you know. Uh, although I was always kind of fairly analytical in in that sense. And I, once I started getting a bit older, I was always nearly trying to find a way, an edge. But I still wouldn't say my discipline was good enough to uh, not have 90% of my bets been fun bets, if you know what I mean. Okay. So there was obviously a point at some point where you know you started to take it more seriously or started to become more professional and actually feel like you could turn a profit. I understand you were working with Dermot Weld and during that time you started to make some money on Betfair. So there must have been, talk me through that process of your journey, if you like, from placing 90% fun bets to actually to a point where you think, well, I can step out on my own and start to make a profit from doing this on its own. I suppose it wasn't until I heard about the betting exchanges that I ever thought it was really a possibility as such in that 
I would have always liked to bet. And when I was working for Dermot Wells, you know, you could go up to the pub on a Saturday and have a few drinks and a few bets and like, it's all good fun. But like when you're placing a bet a couple of minutes before a race and a betting shop taking prices with a big margin built in, I don't think you'd be, and only all you're doing is studying the racing post to make your selections. You're not really going to be making money doing that. So it was only when I was actually off and I was off sick, I'd a collapsed lung. And I must have been reading about these betting exchanges, start looking into them. And I suppose as soon then as you have this on your computer in front of you and low margins and you suddenly start thinking, hold on, I could beat this. Like you put more effort into it and more, you become more analytical. And then I suppose the fun bets become less because now you actually want to win. So you're less likely to, uh, I suppose it'd be like if you were trying to lose weight, if you are after going to the gym and breaking your balls, running 10K or something, you're less likely to eat the donut when you come home because you know what it costs you to, to lose those calories in the first place. And when I started betting a bet for, I suppose it became the same way in that you didn't want to throw money away on the on the horse, the fun bet, when you'd spend so many time trying to spot the, the good bets, I suppose. I think you, that would be, yeah, I think most people would have relate to that, but it must be quite hard to implement it in practice. I think perhaps a lot of people do go and buy, you know, the, the sugary food or the donut after they go to the gym because they feel like, well, I've earned it. You know, you're probably playing down as well your ability. At what was your what was your edge? You know, a lot of people probably have tried betting on the exchanges, but still found it very difficult to to turn a profit. Is there anything that you learned or you used that helped you not just break even, but to actually begin to make a profit? I suppose that no matter when it is, you have to be ahead of whoever you're betting against. But back then, you weren't betting against possibly who you're betting against. Now, in say sports market, like. Like back at the start, the first four or five years, I would have been a pro, even six, seven years, I'd say. Since maybe what, 2002, I was pretty the last day I worked. I think it was 2002. It was the day I used to back pulled up in the champion hurdle. But that was the last day I actually did a, a real job, as what my friends would tell me. That's 21 years then. 12, sorry, 20 years of professional betting. That's amazing. Yeah. But back then, like I used to make quite a good bit of money on even on soccer, just... It was a simple poison distribution type type model on a, I think one or two alterations of my own, but it was basically using like sport and indexes line on the the goals and translating that into uh, maybe next team to score odds or over under two and a half goal odds. And the in play markets in Betfair at that time were so weak; they certainly didn't seem to be uh, full of um, multi million pound syndicates who have the best quants and everything. Um, coming up with their models and say, for instance, next goal market in play, you could nearly would blindly just back no more goal throughout a match. And it was nearly 40% over the odds it should have been most of the time. Like it was like six to one when it should have been maybe about just over three to one type thing. Like, okay. Yes. So the margins were huge. And then obviously gradually they would have got eroded and eroded as more people spotted the inefficiencies in the market. Like, and I don't really any soccer bets I have now are mostly fun bets. Yeah, as the market becomes more and more efficient, obviously all the smart money that comes in. Yeah, there's so much money in the soccer markets that you can get on that they were always going to get taken over, especially the ones, you know, when you're talking about premiership and the big leagues like that, like there's so much money bet in them that there was always going to be other people wanting to get involved and build very sophisticated models to, to beat them by relatively small margins. I see. So nowadays, it's just racing that you, you focus on uh, I assume you've had to very much evolve your system and how you find value when you place bets o- over the past few years. Is it? I was going to ask, is it just backing as well or is there any laying that comes into this? I would do both. Like I have models that I've built myself that I use on the place markets, which are, I would say, very sophisticated. Well, sophisticated with my statistical uh, knowledge, which is all self, self-learned, but I think sophisticated in the sense of how they would, they're doing what I would do if, off with my analysis, if you but with the benefit of having millions of rows of data analyzed instantly for you, so they do well and they will be both back in the lane. Um, myself, I will mostly be back in because the other bets that I'm having, which would be on win markets, are really ones that were all potential premium bets. And the reason I'll back them is if they're over the min price, but there will be the odd horse that I might have looked at a race because of, say, a shorter priced horse that I thought was totally overbet and had reason to think that, you know, it say his last run or something like that, that it was very much flattered by when other people maybe thought it was better than the result. And I could look at a race because of that, try and find a bet to beat it, but it could turn out that maybe 
there's nothing really standing out of the other one. So instead of trying to pick one of them, I might just say that the horse was the original reason I looked at the race. That makes sense. You're just always constantly making a judgment call based on the frame of the race and the pricing. You mentioned there as well, like you built your own models and you, again, you're downplaying your ability there, I'm sure. How did you get started on that? Talk me through that edge you have on racing, especially these days, and you know how you're able to find value in, uh, in the exchange market, assuming, because as we said, they are so efficient very much these days. Well, say the models I'd have in the base market, that would be me basically trying to get a model to think how I think, which I think would be very good analysis. But for some people betting, I know people talk about machine learning now and betting on sports, and I'm sure they're successful machine learning models that are solely throw in all the di- data and it'll, I know they don't just throw it all in, they'll have it organized in a certain manner that will, I suppose, best help the algorithm to analyze it. But I have to kind of understand exactly what it's doing like. So I wanted to do what I could do if I was able to analyze data instantly, basically. And that would be my way of making that model. So I kind of understand it. It won't be kind of like what they'd say, a black box kind of model. I don't understand why it's saying back this horse. I will understand kind of where it's coming from, even though I might have 200 different variables in the model. I will still have looked through it to kind of, before you put it into play, that I'll understand that it's doing what I would kind of want it to do. That it's not just uh, making up its own rules based on, like you could have, I remember reading, um, did you ever hear of uh, Bill Bentner? Yes, in Hong Kong. I remember reading, yeah, something about him before it was an interview with him, I think, and their initial model in Hong Kong or one of the initial ones was making millions and millions of pounds. Like, But he said they put in, they basically let the, the data decide or what went in the model. They, he had very little knowledge, say, of horse racing himself. And he said, like, we put uh, the ground or something in. Now, I don't quote me on the exact variable, but it was something really basic that everyone that is into racing knows was important. And he said, or it could have been this, or Dayson's last run or something like that. It was a fairly basic variable that everyone that backs horses would know it was important. But he didn't know why it was important. He just said the data said it was, so it went in. Whereas I'd be a bit more like, the data could say draw three was good at Kempton over six firms, but draw four wasn't. You could have somebody thrown that into the model because it's statistically significant. But to me, if it doesn't make sense, I still won't put it in because the chances are it's still just... Like, you know, you're going to come up with something that's statistically significant to 5%, five times out of 100, just by randomness. So that would mean five of them things going into a model that really aren't significant. So I think having a knowledge of the sport is still vital. Definitely, at my level of statistical uh, analysis, it would be anyway. No, oh, that makes sense. Uh, you know, I regularly run analysis and it might say, you know, there's an edge on Wednesday, but there isn't on a Thursday. And if you're thinking... Exactly, yeah. yeah, it doesn't make sense. So I, I could never go with it, like, because I, I really wouldn't expect it to continue. No, of course. So having that uh, understanding is crucial because you can interpret and put context into anything that comes forward. That does make sense. So how much time and work goes into this? Talk me through uh, like an average day in your life. You know, what time do you start and how much, you know, where do you begin and what's your, you know, do you build your own tissue prices or do you run your models? How, how does it all work in, you know, an average day in, in, in your life of yourself? Well, in the morning, I... I send tips from half eight to half eleven, so I get up just before that to check what horses that I've got on my list are over the price, say, at the moment, and then decide if any of them I want to get out straight away at half eight. I think the price is going to come in. Like You will see a lot of movement between maybe half seven and half eight in the morning when horses start getting backed in. Yeah. So anything that looks like it's starting to get interest that I want to get out straight away will be then. But if it looks you know, like the exchange price is not getting hit and there's no move with the bookmakers, I'll always wait rather than send in a horse because at the end of the day, I, I'd rather send a bet at 10 o'clock than half eight if I thought I was going to get the same price. Yeah. It won't do my P&L any good, but it will mean more people will be able to get on. So I will always wait if I think price isn't going to come in. And I'll always wait if I think we might get bigger as well. So say if two bookies are going to price, I'll wait and hope maybe six or seven or eight will go up before I send it. But like obviously sometimes that backfires and then somebody else tips it or and the price crashes and you don't get to send it at all. But overall it's no good having um a good P and L if nobody's making any money. So I have to be more conscious of of that side of things than just uh, say sprucing up the P and L. Of course. Yeah. So do you do some work the evening prior to build up that shortlist to say, oh, these are the horses I'm interested in? Yeah. So that would be the first thing I would do in the morning. And then I might take a break or whatever, do other stuff for a while. Then in the afternoon, I might uh, review some past races or 
update. Like I keep all my own um, databases for sectional times and I copy and paste ones from at the races furling my furling sectionals into my own databases and or I could have to do something with my models. But generally, I'll do them over the winter maybe and update them for the following season on the flat or something. And then the evening is when I kind of look at the following day's racing. So in general, now I normally like to look at the odds before I start looking at a race because although I do think it's better not to be biased by seeing odds when you're coming up with your own, I think it can waste too much time as well in that there's not much point in looking at a horse that you could end up making you want maybe eight to one to back it and he's already four to one and you've just spent 45 minutes looking at that race. Mm -hmm. I think it's better to look at the prices they've initially come up with first and see is there is there at least a reasonable chance of you getting the price you want before you waste loads of time going through the whole race. But basically then that would be my evening work and it could depend how long that takes based on how many horses I have that I've kind of noticed that uh, might be under bet next time in my lists, my trackers, I suppose. I was going to say that. Do you uh, filter them down in any way? I've spoken to other people in the past who do take that, maybe price up a, a race and it takes them an hour, but they filter it down to maybe a certain type of race or certain courses or whatever it might be. Or do you just have, you know, take every race meeting going and based it on your a widespread experience of all, all different types of racing codes and distances or what have you? Or do you filter it in any way? No, well, uh, mostly for the horses that race are reviewed, flat races and some of the big national hunt meetings. You can't, you can't possibly look at everything because then you're not doing... It's like I, I would always say, to beat the market, you have to... For me, it would be spot something or read a race better than not just the odds compilers, but the people that would be betting into the overnight market. And you're not really going to do that if you're flicking through 40 races a day because you would really expect somebody to spot everything you'll spot. So you have to delve in a little bit deeper, and to do that, you can't you can't do everything. So it would mostly be flat racing that I'd review. Then, by definition, it would mostly be the flat races that I would have horses of interest that I would look at for the next day. If say I didn't have any horses of interest, though, I might look at a few races, like a few of the better races, and maybe pick one that I thought I liked the shape of for having a bet. More so, if, if say just look at what's favoured. Say the first three in the market, have a quick look at them. See, do you see any obvious um, things you might disagree with? Like, oh, that favourite is in at six to four. Like his last run grossly fat because I mean, he probably should be four to one. Yeah. Straight away, that race will kind of even if I had nothing, no other reason to look at the race, I would now maybe have a look at it and see. Well, there must be a good chance of getting a bet in this race. So I wouldn't like to delve too deep into a race without at least an inclination that it was going to provide a bet. Okay, yeah, especially at the front end of the market because that's going to create bias and potential opportunities elsewhere. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Whereas if you've got a 20 to 1 shot that should be slightly different, then it's not really going to have much impact. As you mentioned as well, I just pick up, you said sectional timing and I've had conversations with people involved in racing recently and some frustration about the lack of consistency with how that's published and times are put together. Do you keep your own records and how important and how big a part of you know finding value is sectional timing for you? Um, it's a big part because I don't think you can uh, read a race properly without having sectional data, or you can read it to a level. Like I could watch a race without any sectional data, I'll have a fair idea what went on, mm -hmm. but you would be wrong sometimes. And it's the times when the people who think they can do it without it are wrong is when you're more, more likely to find value that everyone will miss overnight when you could do it properly. So I would say you can't really do it to race reading to a really expert level without having some sort of timing. Now, there is obviously races where nobody has any timing or it's uh, the data is too uh, dubious, I suppose, to trust and then the same equivalent of not having it at all, really. like I think ATR are good. I've talked to one of the guys in charge of the, I think he's in charge of the website um, before and because I did have one or two concerns about maybe a few issues with the data, but it wasn't, it wasn't huge. Yeah. And I know from talking to them that they are always trying to kind of improve it and they realize where the, the shortfalls are and have, have worked a lot over the last few years to, to make it better. And I, I would trust that data. I don't use their color coding of the section of times. Um, I, I do all of my own kind of a furlong by furlong pairs and stuff like that, which I think is very good because, you know, back in the the times when people first start talking about section of time, it's like Simon Rowlands did an awful lot of the published work on it. Yeah. And he would have had a formula for converting, upgrading horses, say, based on um, the finishing speeds versus power. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And like back then, you could blindly back big markup horses and make money because the odds compilers never spotted them. They didn't pay any attention and they would have been very good value. But while I'd still say the odds compilers don't know as most of it, the overnight markets certainly do. And you won't, any of them obvious ones won't be still around the following morning. So I think furlong by furlong, uh, data is very important for really analyzing what happened in the race. I think getting deep to what happened, why it happened, why a certain horse was suited by this scenario and not by this scenario, and how you think maybe if they played that race was to play out the same horses with a slightly different pace scenario, who you think would do better, who you think might win that didn't win that day. So analyzing that data in depth and seeing, even just comparing what makes horses run fast and seeing the sections of races like a, a slightly quick, a quick mid race section, how it affects finishing speed. Whereas, say, a finishing speed on its own mightn't show that up because it actually could be even versus the overall pace of the race. But the race overall was still inefficient because of, say, they went slow early, then they went quick, then they went slow. Seeing the points that happened and then in conjunction with, say, video analysis to how the horses reacted, which ones came off the bridle, which ones found the hot pace hard, which ones were maybe staying on again at the end tells you so much more than just looking at um, a basic, say, finishing speed. Yeah, so again, let's go delving into the detail and get put in context of the actual race. Uh, how do you keep notes on this? Do you you know, have your own, you talk about your own spreadsheets, your own color-coded, or is the tracker services you use, or just databases you keep yourself? Uh, I'm guessing you spend a lot of time making notes, or because there's too much to just remember, to make sure that you can reference the information next time to go back and say, well, how did this horse perform in perhaps different conditions? Yeah, um, I, I take notes mostly on the horses of interest. Uh, I don't blindly take notes on every race I review because it's just, it would limit the amount of races you could cover. I'd rather take the important bit out of the race, the important horse that I think could be of value in the near future than go through every horse in the race and take a note on them, if you know what I mean. Because when I'm looking at a race that I have a horse of interest in, I'd still like to go back over the other contenders' runs that I think are of relevance and look at them again. And if, if it was something significant, I'd probably remember it anyway. And I'll remember that race and oh yeah, that was fast to run and this horse was flattered, that type of thing. Like I don't go through every horse in the race and take a note on it. Like, but I will take notes on the ones I think could be maybe over bet or under bet the next day mm-hmm. and why I think it. Okay. It makes sense. Obviously been doing this full time enables you to have that opportunity to put all these things into context and gather all that data and all that information. Um, I also wanted to ask you about how much you decide how much to stake on each bet, considering this is your own betting on the exchanges as your primary focus a lot of the time. How much do you choose how much to put on? And you know, do you do that, especially when you're betting on the exchange, you just get everything on as soon as you can? Or do you look to drip feed things in? Or possibly, is it just about considering if you think that price is going to drift or, or shorten? Yeah, pretty much all of that. Like, and. It is. You're not going to place a bet if you think you're going to get bigger. Um, it obviously depends what liquidity is in the market at the time. But most of the time, it would be drip feeding a bet. And yeah, I, the stupidest thing you ever see anyone doing is putting up for hundreds of pounds on a horse when there's only fivers and tenors in the market. But the people that are making those markets are often laying the small amounts. But So they could lay a fiver a hundred times, but they'll never lay 500 in one go. Like, no. Because it'll just basically act as a kind of a blocker on the market. So yeah, you have to, I think, trip it in if you're betting in any way earlier on the exchanges. What was the other part of that question? Well, I was just also wondering, did you take any bet for SP as well, I suppose? And did you take any uh, different types? Is, is it just imagine, imagine it's just evaluating the market and how it adjusts? Because like you say, the too much at the wrong time could have a dramatic impact on the price and it just collapses so you can't get on. So it's just having that time that yourself, you know, you're able to do this full time to look at. Uh, when you're actually betting. I was also asking about your staking and, you know, is it, uh, are you looking to win a fixed amount or are you looking just to get as much as you can on? No, most of my own betting, say on win betting would be, and with the model that run in place market are set to a fixed amount, uh, fixed amount to say return. So more variable stakes taken. So if you were looking to return a thousand euro, you'd have 500 on it, even money and a hundred on it, 10.0 or nine to one. I'd find variable staking much better than level stake. And I think... I had a quick glance at the preview of the review you were doing. And I really don't quote me. I'm, I could be wrong, but it could have mentioned that my ROI could have been a percent higher if I had level staking rather than fixed. That's right. Yeah. But my goal is not to, to maximize ROI, it's to maximize profit. And if you had a point level stake on everything, whatever that point may be, 
because you can't maybe get more than whatever the point is on the 33 to one shot. That would mean you'd have to nearly tailor towards that, which would also mean having a point on the, the two to one shot. Whereas I might have 10 points on it. Mm-hmm. But if my ROI was slightly, you're never going to have the same ROI on a two to one shot as you will on a 20 to one shot because it's easier to beat the market by a higher percentage at, at those odds than it is on shorter price ones. But it's not beating them. So you might have a, but a 15% having 10 points on is much better than a, 25% edge having one point on because I'll have made more money. So to me, it's not about maximizing. If you were on level staking, yes, because you don't even have a one point on the, the two to one shot, the 15% ROI and the 25% ROI would now give you 20% overall in between the two. Whereas if you have more on the two to one shot, it brings your ROI closer to that 15%, but you've made more money, which is really what the objective is, not a, not a higher ROI, which is, shouldn't really be anyone's goal because it's, it's about making money, not... It's easy to have a high ROI. You could just have 10 bets, like very few bets and have much higher criteria. It's about kind of getting the sweet spot for having an ROI that is sustainable and profitable, but also that you're maximizing your profits. Of course, that makes sense. And um, furthermore, obviously betting into Betfair, have you experienced issues? We've seen other professionals who've had issues with Betfair, not just the premium charge, which probably impacts you, but also just the way they are in terms of affordability, especially these days affordability as in getting money in exactly getting money in so as you're a professional gambler you're going to go on losing <laughs> i runs. don't know yeah <laughs> i'm afraid to take it out to find out <laughs> so yeah. I, I withdraw but I, I leave far more in my bet for account currently than i probably would want to leave in it if you know what i mean mm-hmm. because i don't want i'm hoping not to have to just some of the stories that you hear and i think i've seen yourself posting it on uh, twitter i don't know whether it affects the fact that i'm in ireland maybe i'm less likely for that to happen at the moment but um yeah i leave more in than i I would want to solely for that reason. Uh, premium charge, I paid it, but it was only a couple of brief periods years ago, the 40% premium charge, because I think initially they brought in like, what was it, 20 and then they upped it to 40 and you had to have made a million or something lifetime for it to hit. And I did pay it, but it was, um, it was only for a brief enough period. And I kind of, the threshold is 40%. So it basically means you have to have paid 40% of your lifetime earnings in like the gross profits, basically in either commission or other charges. And you'll pay it if you go under that and they'll basically bring it back up to 40%. And I did go under it and it cost me a few, a few quid actually. But I really kind of adjusted my betting slightly to aim for a slightly lower ROI and then higher stakes. Yeah. So that basically would mean that you would be when you're making a lower ROI, you're going to be paying more commission versus your profits, which brought me back under it, but didn't hit my profits, if you know what I mean. So you're tailoring what you do to avoid playing the premium charge. It makes sense because you always use... Yeah, like I actually checked it there today. I'm currently at 41% of my gross profits have been paid in charges. So in theory, I could have, you know, because now it's been over 20 years that my profits will be at such a good amount that even a, you know, a really short term, really good run wouldn't bring you back under that 40%. It'd be still, it might only sound like 1%, but it would be a reasonable buffer, like before I'd have to pay it again. Like, interesting because, uh, you know, how it impacts people who bet professionally, certainly. That's, um, it's certainly something that I was curious about. Let's talk about your service. We've, we've talked about it at points in this conversation. And we say we've done, um, recording this ahead of publishing the review itself. But I think by the time this podcast goes out, it would be published. And you've shown remarkable consistency. You know, you've been over 5,000 bets, you're about 17% ROI. Um, you fared exceptionally well. What's uh, one of the secrets behind your success? Obviously, you, I imagine you've had to evolve your service a fair bit since 2014. Is that when you began, 2013? I think it was 2013. It'd be, yeah. I think this October was nine years. So yeah, October 2013 was the first... 1st of October, I think, was the first day of it. So it's been over nine years yeah, now. Yeah, I'm pulling up the review now. Yes, that's right. End of 2013. I think um, you've had one losing year, although it's only fair to say that it was a very marginal losing year. I think it was minus 0.7% ROI. And that was bookended, well, book, you know, the years pre- prior to that and subsequent to that were all very successful. And I think it's only fair to say, like, the point that I put in the review is, even the best tipsters can have losing years. I think we had a losing year with our Monte Carlo simulations at uh, 8%, so about 1 in 12. You've had 1 in 10 of, of the service. So yeah, what's the secrets behind your success? Do you think is it the, consist- you know, the fact you're doing this for a living and you know exactly your edges and you know exactly how to, uh, how to run the service and how to appeal to people in the current betting climate? Yeah, um, it's really aimed at uh, people 
my bookmaker accounts mainly because I've no reason to give people tips to have an event exchange that will then be competing for me on the price that I could get myself because it is really just a substitute for people getting bets on for me. It's not like it's not like somebody in the media opening up a tipping service because somebody told them they could make extra money when they wouldn't tip thick and snow off a rope like. So it's 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 to make it's to make money, it's to make other people money. So there's no reason for me to do it for exchanges. And another reason I've kind of made it put more emphasis on you really need bookie accounts is because people betting into exchanges when there's no liquidity, like really the bookies will follow Betfair like sheep. Now it could not really be them following them, it's more probably a automated uh quote of a price if if uh, an arb becomes available. So if I tip, let's say, a horse at eight to one, and somebody looks for seven to one on Betfair, nearly every bookie will have cut it under seven to one within a couple, a minute or two. If this nobody touched Betfair, the same horse could stay at eight to one for half an hour. If nobody, if no other, like say, tipping service or connections or anything are back on the horse, my members won't really move it. If it's a good few bookies who've gone the price, what does move it is somebody touching it on Betfair. Or obviously other people tipping the horse or fancying the horse at the same time, or the horse was already coming in before I tipped it. So, like, I try hard. Like, it's, it's hard. I don't know what other people do, but like, I do try and get rid of anyone that is touching uh, Betfair. We've definitely had issues this year with it. Uh, I think I've got rid of the two worst offenders, but the difference it makes is astronomical if nobody touches Betfair, which is really kind of why I like having a kind of a highest price, lower membership, because it's easier to try and keep on top of if you suddenly have somebody, uh, on bet for back in the horse within a couple of minutes of me sending the tip because it affects other people so much that I really try and get rid of anyone that is doing it. Um, it's not always that easy to find them, but there are ways I can do it. But it does take an awful lot of extra work on my pa- uh, behalf to do it. But I think overall it's worth it um, because if you actually had people not touching bet for at all, it would be you could have ten times as many people placing bets with the bookies as the damage one person could do. Just put, pushing the bet fair pricing. Yeah, because the, the rule is no one's to use the exchanges for at least 30 minutes after a better time. Yeah, I think I said 30. Like, like even I don't mind if 15, because most people really should be able to get on with 15 minutes. Like, But yeah, they can use them afterwards the same, but there's no point in really subscribing just to use them afterwards because, you know, you might make a few quid, but it, it wouldn't really be worth it. Like, I think you'd, you really need to have a few accounts and be able to get a bit on with a bookmaker. Like, yeah, that's certainly the what we found in the review itself. You keep records, a very good record, it should be said. The advice price and second biggest price, and even minimum odds, which is actually fascinating. You actually make us uh, basically break even at minimum odds, and it is a service for people a with soft bookmaker or bookmaker accounts or on uh, access to shops or uh, just an ability to get on with bookmakers who will be betting within fifteen minutes at least of a bet being released. You know, in terms of today's betting market, perhaps it seems to be worse than ever in terms of how quick bookmakers are to limit sharp action or become wary of anyone that's taking prices. How do your members cope with this at the moment? Are you getting more feedback these days about people concerned about, oh, I just can't get on or I'm losing accounts quicker than ever? I wouldn't say more feedback. Like I've never really got into the if somebody emails me and says, how can I do this? I don't really send them an email recommending them to do this, that, and the other because I don't even know like what the the legality of some of the stuff people do to get on would be if you put it in print. I wouldn't really like having my name on it, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. So I don't really get into it. I might say something, well, I know a few members do this, that, and this, but apart from that, I don't really get into it. It's, it really is their job to to do the account side of it because my job is to, to find the good bets. Their job is to, to get the bets on because that's really why I got into doing the tipping service rather than getting uh, loads of different people to open accounts for me because I, I actually think maybe the head melt inside of it is less doing the tipping service than if you actually had to deal with bookmakers yourself. <laughs> I can certainly agree with that. Yeah, so you don't find, you haven't found more concerns from people. I, I appreciate you're not going to tell people I, I, I would agree with that. Don't. You know, if they want to find out about how to do things like multi-accounting and go, you know, I'm sure there's places you can find that kind of information out. But in terms of actually people who think, oh, they've lost their accounts, are, are they complaining about that more? Or do you think it's about the same as it always was? Definitely hasn't got any more in recent times. Probably maybe a period a few years ago, you would have heard a little bit more about it. But I, I actually think that most of my members are, are people that have dealt with that and have been dealing with it. 
and kind of it's not a shock to them if you know what I mean. So it's not something they suddenly go emailing me about because they know that it's it's par for the course. I think that's another benefit of maybe a slightly higher price, less members, in that you kind of you only attract people who've kind of done their due diligence and kind of have a fair idea of uh, of what to expect, and they're not surprised then when bookmaker that they've been betting with for 20 years suddenly closes their account, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Because they're suddenly uh, showing that they have a bit of aptitude to make a few quid. But no, I haven't heard anything worse in the last year or two than I did in the previous few. Mm-hmm. But again, it's not really something I've that much correspondence on. I don't, I think most people realize, well, if they get an account closed, well, this is how I'd go about getting another one and they just deal with it. And it's part of, part of the course for them if they're following like a portfolio of tipsters that they might have got on um, from Smart Betting Club, they they kind of know they know the crack like so they're not going to be asking me about it because they know they've done their own uh, research into to how to get around it. I suppose. No, it makes sense. It sounds like you have a, a loyal group of members. People have been with you for for years. I guess you you have core audience, I suppose, of people that follow you in year in year out. Yeah, um, I've had people from almost the very start. I would say, but now in saying about the accounts. When I lose somebody that's been with me for years, it's sometimes because of a job that they've had to move abroad and now can't get on. But 90% of the time, they'll email me and just say they can't get on anymore with accounts that that, that would be the reason they've stopped. But then there is people that have been with me since the start and are managing to keep accounts open. So I don't know how many they've gone through or anything like that. It wouldn't be something I'd know. Or some people are good at getting around it. Some people get sick of it, I suppose. And... Um, it can kind of depend as well um, what people are betting on. Like if, if you have somebody that bets a good bit themselves on their own bets, they have a lot of fun sports bets and they follow me, they probably won't lose accounts at all because my bets will get lost within the, the more the fun bets they have and less likely. But if somebody, I suppose, follows a portfolio of tipsters that are all winning and that's the only bets they have, I would assume they're more likely to get flagged and get accounts closed quicker. No, that's true. Yes, in terms of um, betting into constantly shrewd and shot taking sharp bets, and I think there's there's a probably a whole podcast uh, about topics of how to um, you know place a bunch of bets and stuff that's you know break even or neg- even negative EV or looks to be a mug kind of bet, uh, but actually isn't. And I know <laughs> it's a constant debate about what you can actually place. So, uh, how about coping with variance though? Of having a loyal membership implies that most people can cope with that, but it must still be a point because you know you're not uh, invincible in terms of are at uh, the behest of probability and uh, variance and bad luck at times, and therefore you will have losing runs. How do you people, your members especially, cope with that? Is it uh, do you find you have to cajole people or educate people or help? encourage them during poor runs? Very little. Again, if we had a, a two or three month losing run, or if we have a very bad run of a month, which was really bad, like I, I kind of send a monthly review every month. So, and if we did have a really bad run, I could send something in between, in between that. It nearly, uh, what would you call it? Uh, I'd send something that I, where I would kind of address it and kind of nearly, I'd anticipate that there might be a few queries and kind of just get ahead of it and send it to everyone rather than just replying to the people who might ask and address it. But it, it, I'm sure long-term members would be, uh, <laughs> might not even read it because it's the same stuff over and over again. It's really like the variance is unavoidable. Anyone that thinks you can make money every month with 50 bets a month and a, even an ROI of 20%, it just doesn't happen. Like um, You're going to have losing months. It's, it's just simple maths. It's not something anyone can avoid. I would say somebody who never has a losing month, you would need to be having a colossal amount of bets at a very high ROI. And it's not really possible for anyone doing, definitely not for something like betting just on horse racing and one person doing the job and finding enough good bets the following morning. You're going to have losing months. It's variance. Um, I think it's easier to explain that to people who are long-term members because they've all seen that we can lose 60 points in a month and be profitable by, so say my, I think including my festival packages, my profit is 2,131 points since we launched. That's updated a few days ago. But there will be loads of downturns of, you probably actually have them in your review, 80 points or so in within that. Yeah. So it's easy for me to point out then that losing 80 points in the next period of time is part of a profitable strategy. When people have experienced that it's part of a pro- profitable strategy, 
rather than trying to explain it to somebody who's just joined and we've lost 80 points, if you know what I mean. It's obviously harder to explain to them, but I can still point out, well, we've done this loads of times before and we're still up 2,100 and something points. So therefore, if he tells me, oh, you're crap or your team, I just say, well, no, I'm not. You just have to kind of learn the basics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, uh, talking about the the review there, we've got some of the simulation a Monte Carlo simulation information, which is replicating the profile of your service over uh, many iterations. And the actual um, expected long losing sequence is 50, you know, based on your strike rate. 50 losers in a row. Yeah, you, we could, you could reasonably uh, expect that. Yeah, I think we've had that. I yeah. would have said. I'm sure. I, I, I mean, I don't have the actual, the actual losing sequence in front of me. I think it was perhaps had higher than that. But uh, yeah, and also getting into the, what we call the 50th percentile drawdown, so there's a 50% chance in any given year. So over two years, you'd have it of 160. That's to be expected with your service on its profile. Like I said earlier as well, an 8.3% chance of a, a losing year. And the final one I would say is the p-value. Now the p-value is um, it's a test to establish the likelihood that a series of bets were achieved through luck or chance. Now, often we get like a p-value, depending upon the number of bets, you know, we've got 5,000 here for you. And often we might have like 0.01%. Yours is actually just zero, which indicates that uh, there's no luck involved here. It's pure skill. And that goes down to the fact that we have all this data and you've been doing it for such a long time as well. So all of that is in the review itself. And uh, obviously people can can read that and dig into the, those figures because it does provide context to, you know, the reality of uh, of betting. Um, the final question, I suppose, as well is, you know, that's variance from members and how from yourself as a professional gambler. How do you find uh, coping with the oscillation of your know, betting for an income, obviously the tipping service is different, but your own bets and you know when you go through dry spells, do you uh, enjoy what you do or do you find it a challenge at times? How do you cope with you know handling bad runs? I think personally I handle them quite well with my own betting. I suppose I've been doing it for so long now that I'm used to it. As long as you have enough money to pay the bills, the downturns, I kind of I just accept them. I get on with it. Um, I don't think they affect me that much. It is more of an issue for the service because then you feel that, you know, there's other people depending on you who mightn't have, not that they should ever be losing money to pay the bills because they should be a separate bank, but their circumstance could be that they just joined and we've had a downturn. You'd find that harder because although most people understand, you still feel like they haven't got the load of good runs that we've had in the bank, so to speak. So yeah. they're going to maybe think you're, you're not much good or that, but. I kind of at the end of the day accept as well that I, I can't control it. So all I can do is do my best and variance is going to happen and there's nothing I can do to stop it. So I, I, I kind of have a level of acceptance over it. Yeah, I've obviously been doing this for 20 years. So you were an old hand at uh, handling the variance that comes across your way. So no, really, really interesting to hear about that and uh, how you handle it. But you know, again, thank you ever so much for spending the time with me today. I really enjoyed this. It was an opportunity to talk to someone who actually you know, makes a living betting on Betfair and also running a tipping service and how it all works and your approach. It's been a fascinating conversation. We talked about the review and that will be out by the time this podcast drops. So people can read that in the Smart Betting Club uh, as a Smart Betting Club member. But how can people uh, find out more about you? Do you want to fire out some links on your website and any ways they can get in touch? The website is learnbetwin.com. There is articles and stuff I have on it, but most of them are older ones now. I, love, I have had emails from people saying they still find them useful. I've been meaning to do a bit more work with it and update it and get back to maybe doing the free bet of the day, which I haven't done in a few months. I've been a bit lazy on it. So hopefully I'll make a bit more effort with the website over the winter. I'm on Twitter. I think it's just my name, Declamara76. Well, it's not at anything, is it? Because that's my email address. Um, I think, yeah, my Twitter handle is Declamara76. And that's pretty much it. Like the, all the details on the premium service are on the website, Learn About Win. As I said, I do have a free bet of the day page, but I haven't actually done one um, in a good few months. And I'll probably try to get back doing that maybe a bit more often. It's just as not often because I've spent all morning looking at uh, the prices and when to send bets. I'll have other stuff to do as soon as that's finished. And I might not be at the computer to write up a, a free bet. Other times it could be I don't really want to because I actually write a reasoning behind it. I don't want to give away the reason because I think I don't want to... An angle is only really an angle if, if not many other people know about it. So um, you sometimes don't want to give away the reasoning. So it kind of limits ones. And then because you haven't done them ones, you don't want to do the other one that you maybe don't fancy quite as much. And, but there is that free bet has still been profitable. So I'll try to get back to doing that a bit more regularly over the winter. 
and yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, so I rec- recommend people. I'll drop the links into the show notes. So if they want to find you on Twitter um, or they want to check out your website, and I, I agree, there's some really good information and articles. Some I think it's your betting school, I think that's what you call it, but there's some educational articles in there that are timeless. Like I say, I'm going to update them, but some of the fundamentals, what we're talking today about variance, probability, for example, they all still ring true. They're not going to change anytime soon. So that's great. Thank you ever so much, Declan, for for taking the time to be on the podcast. And uh, I wish you well moving forward. The plans to continue as you are with Learn Bet Win, no plans to change anything? No, I don't think so. Not in the immediate future. Um, I do think overall my my strength is race reading kind of and form analysis. And that is... I would, whereas my weakness if, would be maybe more is today to day for some low grade horse. So I, like, I always think I've done better in better class races. Like my, I've done festival packages, which would pretty most be, mostly be Shetland, but other Ascot and Aintree as well. And the ROI has been higher in that, albeit a smaller sample size. But even my own uh, bet, and I think I've done results on uh, just Saturdays, which is generally higher class ratings, I've done better. You always feel more confident when you've analyzed the race and the price is too big in a better class race that there's not something you don't know going to um, be a reason that it's not actually a good bet. So I don't know. I kind of have to see how, how things go in the next couple of years with the bookies. Like if they keep, it, like it can get frustrating when you have X amount of horses that you think are a really good bet the night before and 19 out of 20 of them have got caught by the following morning. Like, in other words, if your job was to beat the bookies, it would be very easy. That, like, they'd pretty much miss anything that isn't blatantly obvious. But it still doesn't mean that you've, you're going to get a bet on it because it's got uh, corrected with people betting into the overnight markets. And that can be frustrating, in lower, especially in lower-class racing when it's more likely to happen. So, um, I'd be, yeah, there'd be potential that I could maybe just bet on better-class racing in the future. But I, I, at the moment, I don't have any plans to change. I've certainly seen your Cheltenham packages and uh, certainly someone I look to read about what you're doing at festivals like that. Uh, very informative indeed. And um, well, you know, I wish you all the best. We continue to proof you. We've been a Hall of Fame service for several years and, you know, uh, can't envisage uh, that changing based on the review we've, well, it hasn't, but the review we published is exceptionally, you run a, a very well-run service, exceptionally good results and, and records. And I encourage people to go and um, visit your website and, and find out more. So, with that, Declan, I'll thank you again for coming on and I wish you all the very best. Here's to the next uh, 10 years or so of uh, running your service. Cheers, Pete. Thank you. Thank you.